It's Freedom Files with James Burns. Welcome to the Freedom Files podcast for this Thursday, March 22nd, 2012. I am James Burns. We are joined now by Bob Chapman. His website is theinternationalforecaster.com. Bob, how are you doing today, sir? Well, not bad at all. Yeah, I'm sorry I missed you last week. I was uh, (laughs) under the weather. I caught a nasty uh, throat thing. But anyways, I'm happy to be back with you this week and a lot of things for us to talk about. Uh, First off, I'd like to uh, go to uh, France with what transpired there, Uh, that tragedy. uh, Muhammad uh, Mera, who uh, murdered seven people, apparently, uh, was killed uh, hours ago in a gunfight with French police in southwest. The murders took place in southwest France, and they're all saying the same thing, Bob, basically, that Sarkozy stands to gain from the brutal killings. And as you well know, Bob, because you're familiar with the Le Pen family, that right now he's uh, basically threatened... uh, Election-wise, against uh, you know uh, Miss Le Pen, uh, what do you think the uh, fallout from all this is going to be? And do you believe that this is possibly some sort of false flag event? Oh, I definitely think it's a false flag event. Uh, of course, proving it is another thing. But uh, that's the kind of thing that brings about uh, uh, compassion, uh, especially because the people who were murdered were Jewish, and of course, there's uh, no excuse for murdering anybody. And um, so, yeah, he's going to gain from that. There's no question. And uh, he's Jewish. And Mr. Holland is Jewish as well. I don't know that most people know that. So uh, how much he'll glean off that remains to be seen. But he'll get a little edge, and who knows what they'll do next. Yeah, that's always the concerning part, Bob, about all these little shenanigans that they like to pull off behind the scenes in order to keep themselves in power. And, yeah, you're right. I agree with you entirely. Killing anybody is wrong. It doesn't matter what they happen to be, whether they're black, white, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, etc. It's brutal what was done, uh, these murders. And it's just sad that you see individuals like Sarkozy uh, taking full advantage of the situation. You're always going to have that, especially if it was planned that way. I mean, how, how threatened is Sarkozy by Le Pen? right now in France? Well, as we get closer to the preliminary, uh, we'll see more thrust by her campaign. And, uh, you know, if he picks up a percentage point from Holland and loses one to her, you know, he's right back restarted. And she's running on, let's get rid of the euro and the European Union. That's it. And those are her strong points. And uh, that's certainly not something he wants to do. But on the other hand, uh, if you look back, um, Holland has said the same thing. Let's get rid of them. So um, I think I think Holland will probably get elected. And this just shows you the turning of the tide that's going on in France and I think a lot of other countries as well in Europe. And Uh, The regard is the growing number of people throughout all these countries. If there's one thing that seems to be a a common trend is that they're sick and tired of the European Union. And taking orders from people who don't understand their problems. Absolutely. And I think that's that's something that uh, we have in common with the people of Europe. I mean, more and more Americans are getting tired of what we're having to deal with over here. But uh, what is all this going to lead towards in the European Union if, say, Hamid or Le Pen end up becoming the next president of France? And uh, could we see basically a domino effect with more anti-UN uh, presidential uh, prime ministers being elected to office throughout Europe? Well, I think that is a move in that direction in Holland. I think you're uh, not too long before you're going to see a election called, even though there's two years to go. And, uh, you know, all of the uh, complaints uh, of Germans against their current government and the amount of money that's being spent uh, in um, rescuing these uh, uh, so-called bailout countries. And, And so there's big things going to happen over there. That's why everything's so quiet right now. 
because uh, that great deal may fail. And so uh, we'll find out in time here, and that's why there's pressure on gold, silver, and commodities, and that's why they hold the market up. That's what's going on. It, it definitely does seem to be uh, somewhat of a calm before the storm, and it wouldn't surprise me at all, Bob, if that deal with the, with Greek did fall apart. I mean, it's a it's a very bad deal to begin with. I mean, that's all they've been trying to uh, shove down the people of Greece's throats is one bad deal after another. That's true. And you get an election coming up. I didn't see anything about the uh, bonds interest and the bonds themselves coming due, which was a couple of days ago. Not a word. So, you know, who knows what's going on? Yeah, I mean, uh, but eventually we're going to find out one way or the other, even if, if they are trying to keep it under wraps. And it doesn't really surprise me because, I mean, like we just mentioned a moment ago, I mean, the people of Europe are, are starting to get fed up with what's been happening to all their countries because of this uh, EU takeover. Um, the, uh, what the IMF, the ECB, all getting more and more powerful, basically robbing the peoples of these countries blind. And it's only a matter of time before the people, you know, I mean, they're already hitting the streets in several countries, but this thing could end up erupting throughout the entire Eurozone. Well, there's been nonstop uh, demonstrations in Spain, uh, Italy, and Portugal for the last uh, several weeks. Uh, one of them uh, last weekend in Spain, uh, 500,000 people in 60 cities. I mean, I, that's quite a participation. It is, indeed. I mean, it's just amazing that you have people waking up over there and while at the same time here in our country uh <laughs> not even a peep people are more concerned about baseball season or or which quarterbacks getting traded to which team well you're right and uh you know i hark back to uh, the good log uh, archipelago by uh alexander solzhenitsyn and he said while they were in there uh all these people had complained about government so they got thrown in jail and while they were in there, all these dissidents, they all discussed, what, what did we do wrong? And uh, uh, the answer is they didn't do anything wrong, except nobody overtly acted against government. So you got to put it all together. If the people are disturbed and you got enough backing, you got to do something demonstratively that is going to make the government back down or bring about a crisis and a confrontation. They didn't do it, and we're not doing it. No, we're not. And it, it just really makes me wonder. I know we've asked this question several times, Bob. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I just look at this, and, I, and I, I see everything going on in our country. I mean, last week, for example, Obama passed a, another executive order. Uh, basically, uh, the, the eventual plan is to bring martial law in peacetime, the, the nationalization of factories, um, industry, the basically you know, forced conscript conscriptorship of American citizens for labor, for work, um, basically a form of slavery, and yet not a peep, not even a, not, it's not even really a big deal to most Americans. That's right. And uh, most of them don't even know about it. And um, they're just walking around kicking moonbeams. They live in a world that I don't know about. Yeah, it's just a, a mystery. I mean, it's just one more thing after another. You know, it's just every week it seems like they're they're passing a new law or a new executive, you know, order or a new department, just curtailing our freedoms even more and more. And then you see what's happening in uh, what Los Angeles right now. And uh, this is uh, updated news. The uh, city council has okayed a resolution urging the media to curb uh, radio talk show hosts from saying anything that might be considered racist racist or sexist, and while I'm completely against any talk show host saying anything of that regard, you know, racial or, or sexist, at the same time, Bob, you know, we do have freedom of speech in this country. At least we once did, and you go in and you start passing resolutions and laws curtailing, you know, talk show hosts and people's rights to say whatever they want, no matter how uh, hateful or ridiculous or foolish it sounds. That's when you see the PC movement really starting to come after us. Well, it's not uh, surprising coming from L.A. I lived there for 36 years, and uh, we had some good mayors in Los Angeles, Sam Yorty, and Ridden was a good mayor, but the rest of them were trash. 
uh, backed by Democrat machines, and um, which gave you the worst of government and uh, the most of thievery. It's like any major city in the world. Uh, but uh, today, uh, the, uh, the city council is uh, predominantly uh, communist, uh, socialist, left-wing. A lot of them are Mexican-Americans. And they seem to like that thing. And it's just sad because they, they seem to forget about the, the American side of their heritage. And we're all Americans, in my opinion. Anyone that was born and grow, grew up in America, it doesn't matter if you're white, Anglo, black, Hispanic, Asian, etc. We're all Americans, and we were all brought under the Constitution and Bill of Rights. And, and this goes completely against the First Amendment. I know that there's people out there that says hateful things that are racist and sexist against women and other groups. And I personally, morally, think that that's wrong. But at the same time, you know, we, we have the First Amendment to protect everybody's right to freedom of speech. If other cities start adopting resolutions similar to what they're passing in Los Angeles, then, I mean, that's a direct assault on the First Amendment. And, I mean, who knows how far they will go with this, uh, you know, faux PC uh, <laughs> attack on the First Amendment. Now, in the case of L.A., it could end up in race war. And uh, with the black people caught in the middle. And uh, it's not good. Uh, they don't know what they're... Uh, they're doing here uh, it's a very very dangerous it absolutely is and it and it sets the president for you know like i mentioned other cities to start adopting these rules as well and it, it just imagines I me mean, first off they start attacking you know people for saying something racist or sexist on the air but where does it stop bob there's no end to it now they just keep on doing it more and more um victims uh, for the people to live by um, and and the state and the county is broke in fact almost every county in California is broke and uh, so with that said uh, they'll grab for more and more and more out of an ever reducing pie so to speak yeah I mean and that seems to be par for the course not just in California, but across the entire country, uh, city councils are, are in debt. They're having to get loans after loans, uh, burying themselves even deeper, not to mention the national debt itself. And it's just, <laughs> it's all compiling to one big critical mass. And sooner or later, it's just going to all come crashing down around us. That's right. And it'll happen in other cities as well. And um, again, you know, even with, law enforcement or the National Guard, uh, there's, uh, there's no protection there. Just no protection. None whatsoever. I mean, it's what's sad because you have a number of uh, cities already across the country. I think what Camden, New Jersey, a couple months ago, they laid off, I think, I, I could be exaggerating, but I think it was almost the entire police force because of their budget was. And, of course, I mean, we do need some police officers. I do, I do think that it has gotten out of control with how bad things have gotten in that regard. But I would like to see some police on the streets, not obviously, you know, in black uniforms with, you know, full, <laughs> you know, walking around like big giant Terminators. But at the same time, I recognize a need for uh, law enforcement in our country. Uh, the uh, law enforcement's in a Extremely difficult position. Terrible position. And I, you know, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, they may be ordered by their leadership to follow federal government dictums. Um, on the other hand, uh, they may side with the people or they might try to get in between. They're in a tough spot. I certainly wouldn't want to be one on the under what's going on right now. Yeah, I mean it's a definitely a difficult situation for police officers, for sheriff's deputies. But I, I've seen a growing number of police and uh, sheriff's deputies, you know, calling several shows, including Alex Jones's show. I have a sheriff's deputy that listens to my show at night, and he called up and he's you know pro Ron Paul, he's pro Constitution and Bill of Rights, and he's been talking to his fellow shepherd you know, sheriff deputies about these sorts of things. And I think that's that's really the solution there, Bob. You have to have men and women in law enforcement who 
truly do believe in the in the Constitution that they swear to uphold and defend, you know, take the time to go talk to their brothers and sisters in uniform and say, look, you know, we swore to defend this thing. We swore to defend the people of the United States from all enemies, foreign and domestic. And if the time ever comes in this country where we're given these orders, we have to stand against them. I think they have to decide not to take federal orders. That's the bottom line. Absolutely. And that's what it comes down to. They have to recognize that their, their, their boss is not the federal government. Their boss is their fellow citizens in their communities, in their fellow towns and cities and counties. Those that, you know, the taxpayers, their, uh, some of them are their friends, family members, whose you know, taxes you know, pay their salaries. That's who they answer to, not the, uh, you know, the goons from the den of crooks. That's right. And, and, that's, and that brings us to another point regarding our elected officials in general. I mean, for too long now, they have been, you know, going about acting like they're lords over us, you know, our, our congressmen, our senators, the presidents. And what they, what they fail to realize, and that's one thing I think that more and more people need to step up and rec- recognize and start reminding their, their congressman, their senator, that uh, that paycheck that you're getting, is coming from us, from our salaries. We're the one who votes for you guys. We're the ones who can vote you out of office. Well, it's very difficult, obviously, to vote out an incumbent. But at the same time, we have to reinstill that power that we, the people, are the real employers of the elected officials at all levels of government, foreign, I mean, federal, state, and local. That's right. And those are the uh, hot buttons that have to be hit. But, you know, having police within other police talking about, you know, the responsibility and what their crime job is, uh, is protecting the local public. Uh, It's not the federal government. It's the local public. That's that's a very good point there, Bob. Bob Chapman is my guest. His website is theinternationalforecaster.com. What do you think about all this uh, shenanigans that have been going on the past couple of weeks, these primaries and, of course, the most recent caucuses, uh, specifically out of Missouri? I mean, they've had several run-ins between the neocon, the neocon GOP establishment in these caucuses and Ron Paul supporters, and it, it's, just getting, it's just starting to get really, really nasty. You're right, and uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, the Republican National Committee and those uh, who uh, are in favor of the Romney-Santorum candidates, uh, they're a disgrace. An absolute disgrace. And they're in there trying to tell people what to do. They're lying, cheating, and stealing. They've been fixing the elections. Um, A high school student could figure that out. (laughs) And uh, there's no end to it. And then when you complain about it, say, well, that's that's wrong. We're supposed to do that. or or, Those are our delegates. And they say no. And now it's getting down to fistfights. Yeah, I mean, see, a lot of people are getting paid a lot of money. This is what's going on. That's very true. I mean, they're getting paid a lot of money. They're being offered sweet, cushy jobs and positions, and you know, anything they can to sell their soul out and not follow the laws and the rules that are on the books. And it, it's pretty sad, Bob. It certainly is. Uh, it's a government out of control, run by a crime syndicate. Yeah, you know, this is my question, Bob, and I mean, this is you know kind of one of those easy answers because uh, I mean, most of the federal agencies and uh, departments and commissions are basically worthless. You have the FEC, the Federal Elections Commission. Uh, they're not really lifting a finger to investigate any of these primary or caucuses, despite the fact that the evidence is compiling video ev- evidence, documents that there there's some shenanigans going on, but it doesn't look like the FEC is doing anything. And you're right. And uh, that is probably because uh, the Democrats are in power and let them, they're saying, uh, let them uh, do what they want to do. Yeah, it's just getting out of control. And, and I talked about this the other night on my radio show. And this is one thing I don't understand when it comes to election fraud. Obviously, it's not new. It's been around since, you know, probably the times of the early democracies. And we're obviously not a democracy. We're a republic, but we still have elections. 
I don't understand, Bob, why isn't the punishment for election fraud more stiff than it is? It seems like that most of the time all these people have to do is resign, and a couple months later they get another position uh, for taking one for the team, and th there is no investigation. There seems to be no, no arrest made, no, no trials, and no prison sentences. That's right, and that's where the criminality comes in. And it's nothing new. It's been going on for centuries. And uh, all you can do is try to combat it. And if you can't, that really, people say the heck with it. We're going to have a revolution. And that definitely seems to be the direction we're being headed towards, Bob, is, you know, I mean, I personally, and we've talked about this countless times as well, I personally don't want a violent revolution because I've seen how most violent revolutions ends. I mean, we've talked extensively about what happened with the French Revolution. I mean, that was bloody. It was horrible. It was a nightmare. And... We want a peaceful restoration of our republic, of our government, of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. But it seems like that you know both parties, which are basically one and the same now, both bought and paid for, both corrupt and out of control. And this government, I mean, don't get me don't get me started on that. I mean, they're just doing everything they can to you know push us into that direction. Right, and that'll supply them with the confrontation to effect martial law, whether there's war or not. And uh, uh, what they put in place uh, through that executive order is the same thing that was put in place in 1939 in the United States uh, because they knew the war was coming because they were planning it. And the same thing happened in uh, the Soviet Union. And uh, the Enabling Act of 1933 allowed that to happen in Germany under Adolf Hitler and brought him to power as a dictator. Yeah, I mean, they've been laying the pieces in place for this police state grid for, you know, a number of years now. I mean, it's it could go back, you know, several decades. But, I mean, even the past decade alone, which is where we've seen it accelerate, I mean, with the Patriot Act, with the uh, you know Department of Homeland Security, TSA, all these executive orders and other police state laws they've in, indoctrinated. I mean, it's it's getting to the very, very close, Bob. And I, I don't know how close we are to uh, um you know, scenario when they officially decide to flip the switch on us. But I just get that feeling that they're almost ready to do it. I do, too. So we'll have an event. There's no telling when they'll pull it. It might be next year. It might be in three weeks. Uh, who knows? They're going to do what they want to do. And, uh, you know, if they start getting nasty and people start getting shot and killed, uh, that's the beginning of revolution. And that, that's when the gloves come off. And I, I don't want us to go there. I, I don't like that, but that's exactly what they're doing. They're pushing us into that, uh, <laughs> into that direction. And it reminds me of what happened, you know, in the days leading up to the American Revolution. Actually, you know, at least a, a you know, couple years and a, a decade till. I mean, the, col the colonists were not wanting war with, with the uh, English Empire. They were not wanting war with King George III. They, they were just, they were trying to peacefully prevent a revolution. I mean, they, they were going back and forth with Parliament saying, look, we don't like all these stamp acts and tax acts and tea acts and et cetera. But uh, the British kept pushing them. They kept on pushing them. They kept sending more redcoats over. They kept, you know, there were several incidences that happened. And eventually, you know, that's when the gloves came off and there was a war. That's right. And uh, the British thought that they could solidify even more control over those colonies and they underestimated the Native American who said uh, at that time uh, we're not going to put up with that anymore. And this is just another example Bob how history is repeating itself because while there is a number of Americans unfortunately that are asleep they're, they've been programmed, brainwashed a bunch of sheeple, jellyfish, zombies whatever you want to call them that won't do anything, that'll happily uh, march into the camps and do whatever they're told. Uh, but there's also a growing number of Americans out there that are awake, that are aware of what, what's transpiring, sick and tired of the status quo, of things going from bad to worse to nightmare. And they're, they're just waiting for that moment, you know, that moment when the, you know, you know the line in the sand is crossed and they're going to say, that's it. We've done what we can. We've tried to peacefully turn things around, and, um, well, we're going to fight. And once that happens, Bob, 
I mean, it's going to be no surrender for us. We're going to fight them till we no longer can. That's right. But I, I don't think it'll last long. I don't, I, the reason I say that is that uh, I, I think there's a good chance of a military coup in America. Do you think that a possible military coup, Bob, would be uh, for, the, for the best or for the worst in the long run? Who knows? You don't know until you pull the trigger. And see, that, that, that is a very scary scenario because I'm, I'm sure that there are some great people serving in the military, obviously. But there, I'm pretty sure there's probably also some really good officers in the upper levels of the military. But at the same time, there's probably some very, very scary individuals that happen to be, you know, majors, colonels, and generals, and admirals. And I, I guess what it really depends on, Bob, is what kind ends up, you know, doing it. You know, one of the one of the good guys that actually does believe in the people, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, are one of these, you know, Caesar types. Well, I think you'd get them out of the Pentagon uh, in the field grade officer rankings, Colonel and Downwood. Uh, these are, these are people who don't aspire to be in the Pentagon or to be generals for the most part, and uh, so uh, they agree with their non-coms and other senior offices, and these people all talk. I, I know. I, I talk to them all the time. They know what's going on. But I'll tell you one thing. If I wasn't on the air there, uh, over the last seven years, there wouldn't have been many people uh, uh, who uh, would have been inf informed the way they are today about what is really going on behind the scenes. Definitely, Bob, and I mean, don't don't sell yourself short there. I mean, you've played a huge role over the past several years and uh, past several decades of doing uh, your newsletter, waking up the masses. I mean, you go on a, after my show, of course, you go on the Marine Disquisition, which is very popular with the military. And you know, without you and others out there, uh, I think we'd be in a lot worse situation. I think you're right, but I did it because I thought it was necessary. And I was a, a vet, and, and so there was a commonality, at least, of interest. And I think it's important that everybody knows the facts. And everybody isn't going to know the facts because they don't all listen to me and you and so on. But uh, that will happen. They'll start listening. Will it be too late? I don't know. Yeah, that's definitely I mean, a big when question. You, when you see... When you see a gun show in Northern California last weekend, a subscriber went in and at 1 o'clock to buy some ammo. And they had somebody and he said, but why do you have so little? And the man said, we opened up at 8 o'clock and we had two 44 trailers, both full of ammunition. It's all gone. Now, does that tell you something? Well, it, it tells me that there's a growing number of American people who have a feeling in their guts that something is going to transpire. And this has been happening for the past several years now. I mean, this is, I mean, gun sales have been, you know, getting higher and higher, you know, record sales since nine, uh, what, 2009. In 2009, they were high. In 2010, they were high. 2011, and now 2012, they're up. So there's definitely a lot of Americans out there, Bob, that, you know, have some, even, even if they don't know exactly what's going on like we do, I mean, they have something. There's some sixth sense there that tells them that there's, a, you know, something dark on the horizon coming our way, and we have to be prepared for it. I think you get the same thing, too, with the ordering of uh, uh, freeze-dried and dehydrated foods. Uh, from time to time, it's, it's difficult to get delivery. And, of course, the prices keep on going up. Now, I mean, people are preparing in so many ways. You know, they're they're storing food, they're they're storing water, they're anything else they need, hygiene products, uh, like gold and silver. If any, if they have any extra money after buying everything else, they're getting gold and silver. They're fortifying their homes. They're learning how to use a firearm if they never used one before in their life. I mean, people know that we are you know nowhere near out of the neck of the woods, despite the lies coming from the government and the mainstream media. Uh, they know deep down inside, that it's only going to get worse from here. And if you aren't 
preparing yourself and your family to survive what's to come, you're going to be at the mercy of this government. And that's not where I want to be, to be honest. Yep. Bob Chapman is my guest. His website is theinternationalforecaster.com. Bob, speaking of uh, dark things on our horizon, what is the uh, latest uh, economic-wise going on in the European Union, the U.S., and around the rest of the world? Well, I think uh, there's going to be lots more problems coming out of Europe, and that's why uh, I mentioned earlier the suppression of commodities and gold and silver and the continuing ramping up of the stock market. And uh, I think what's going to end up happening uh, is that um, they're going to lose their grip on things in Europe, and uh, that whole house of cards may come tumbling down. And um, I don't see it getting any better. Uh, we had talk in Syria of Russian troops. Now Russia says we don't have any troops there. So uh, who knows? Um, I, I tend to believe them rather than the uh, major media, uh, which is tragic. Um, but it's the same thing every place else. Uh, England, two weeks ago, told us they were bankrupt. I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, the people who read my publication and read about England and read the links that I give them, I mean, boy, are they in sad shape. And uh, France is headed uh, in that direction as well, uh, which most people are not aware of at all. Um, and then, of course, you get the U.S., uh, but they rigged everything, <laughs> and they think they're going to get away scot-free, and that's not going to happen. Yeah, speaking of uh, the uh, goings-on in the U.S., I'm sure you, you heard about this, Bob. Uh, Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke, I think he was speaking at George Washington University, he, he came out and said that uh, paper money is better than the gold standard to solve our financial problems. I mean, talk about a good laugh there. <laughs> I wonder what the uh, students thought. I mean, they didn't that, get that, a take on it. That, that is definitely a good question. I mean, it just depends on on how educated or how programmed they are. I mean, if if they are followers of Austrian economics, I'm sure it did give them a good chuckle. But if they're more into the uh, you know the the you know lies of Keynesian, then uh, they probably you know drank that Kool Aid down just fine. Uh, it's hard to tell, and uh, it's different from university to university. So, uh, but I would have liked to have seen some commentaries uh, from there, but we didn't get them. Now, that's not surprising at all. But I mean, if if you were on the stage and, and you were having like kind of a you know Lincoln Douglas you know Lincoln Douglas style debate with Ben, and he said that, what would be your response to him? Um, that co comment on its own <laughs> uh, disqualifies you for you from being head of the Federal Reserve. I mean, I've never heard anything so stupid in my life. Every civilization that has paper money that's been fiat has collapsed. And you know what, Bob? You could probably spend you know a you know good couple of minutes you know listing each and every single you know country and nation that has gone down the same road. And it's just it's just sad. I mean that a we we have this you know this controlled uh, central bank known as the Federal Reserve, which has been around for too long, in my opinion. And on top of that, we have we have a genius like Ben Bernanke going around, uh, just you know throwing out his lies to the you know these college students, the uh, you know saying that paper money's better. My question is, how can you say that with the fact that the dollar is continuing to deteriorate in value, while at the same time oil prices, gas prices, food prices, and everything else is going up? Well, he's not challenged. That's what the problem is, unless he gets in with Ron Paul. And Ron Paul is a gentleman. Uh, if I was questioned, I mean, it might be much different. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it is sad that that they just you know too many people in our government and throughout the country still. I mean, even though more people have woken up to the reality of the Federal Reserve system, there's still plenty out there that that don't get it, and <laughs> it's just sad. I mean, it really is, Bob. I mean, it's. Yeah, and it's good, though. I mean, it's a good thing that without Ron Paul there, you know, with his message, you know, freedom, liberty, and exposing the Federal Reserve over the past four years alone, I mean, he's done it obviously much further than that, but 
it's over the past four years that he's woken up more people, cured their apathy. And it reminds me of something, you know, regarding the, the dollar situation that Newt Gingrich was in town because we have the Louisiana primary coming up on Saturday. And he's been promoting this idea of getting gas down to $2.50. But the one thing he's not talking about is the fact that as long as the dollar is continuing to lose value with inflation going up, you could be we could have as much gas and oil out there in the world uh, coming into uh, the U.S., and I don't think the, the, the price would ever go back down. I think you're right. But that's just a little game he's playing. And he's in there as a uh, spoiler. And uh, that's just what he's going to do, spoil things. Yeah, I, I came across this also, Bob, regarding Newt Gingrich. Uh, his campaign, of course, this, was, this is nothing new because his campaign was in debt back over the summer. Right now, his campaign is in the red by uh, over a million dollars. Let's see, $1.55 million. My question to you, Bob, is this. If you're wanting to be president of the United States and your campaign is in the red, why should you expect people to take you seriously? You shouldn't. You absolutely shouldn't. I, mean, I, I just wonder. I mean, here's another question. Like, say, for example, he drops out of the race after this weekend, after the Louisiana primary. And what becomes of that debt? I mean, who ends up paying for it? Does he have to pay for it out of his own pocket? Or is that going to be, you know, out of our pockets? I mean, that, that's a really good question, I think. Well, usually um, the Republican National Committee will step in and pay it, or uh, Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan, and they all pop up and say, all right, here, you're covered. Now, that wouldn't surprise me at all. They say, okay, well, we'll come in, Newt, and we'll get you out of debt. You just do what we tell you to do. You do this, you do that, and we'll get it all taken care of. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I just, I don't understand it at all. But anyways, uh, they had, I'll uh, see, uh, it's it's just, I don't know, it's not, I, I, it's like, a, if you know, it's a nice sunny day today, Bob, I, I feel this dark cloud hovering over my state because of all these Congress, you know, all these elected officials, you know, coming around, like, uh, what, like Newt Gingrich and uh, Santorum, he's going to be back tomorrow. Uh, Romney's going to be here as well. <laughs> and I'm just wondering, uh <laughs> I think I think our state, our city is going to need a nice long, wa- you know, showering and cleansing after uh, this weekend. Detoxification. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the good news is Bob, t- uh, Bob, uh, Ron Paul is uh, coming to Louisiana. He's going to be uh, uh, two locations. He's going to be at. He's going to be in uh, Central Louisiana, uh, speaking at Louisiana College, and that's going to take place uh, around uh, twelve o'clock noon Central. Then he's going to be down in South Louisiana in Hammond, Louisiana at Southeastern University, and that's going to take place at 7 o'clock at night. So despite the fact you have uh, the three clowns in the Pelican State, you also have a, a true champion of the Constitution coming our way as well. That's good, and the people will be there to hear him by the thousands as they rig another election. Mm-hmm. And, and we're going to be out too. I mean, I, I think we're planning on uh, doing some exit polling this weekend. I, I'm going to probably volunteer for that. And it's going to be interesting, you know. I'm going to try and get everybody to uh, tell me who they voted for. And hopefully we'll be able to compile the numbers and, you know, we'll be able to try and keep it as honest as possible. But I have no doubt in my mind that there's going to be some more, you know, typical shenanigans going on. You know, and and as you may know quite a deal about Louisiana politics, I mean, we're known for our corruption here in Louisiana. We go all the way back to the (laughs) Huey P. Long days. (laughs) So... I mean, that, that's nothing new here in our state, but it's just sad that you see that running rampant across the country. Yes, um, uh, Huey Long was the first one in Louisiana, but uh, uh, he was an outstanding one. Mm-hmm. Uh, each know. city has their historical creature, <laughs> and, um, and they get lost in history, most of them. But, you know, most of us get lost in history when we die, so... Uh, it's not significant. That's a very valid point there, Bob. And I'll, I'll say this. This is kind of sad because when I took uh, Louisiana history in college a couple years ago and, you know, our, the section we covered over Huey Long and the, the, the teacher talked about, you know, all the shenanigans, all the backdoor deals that he did. 
But at the same time, they they paint Huey Long as some sort of hero in Louisiana, and I I looking at it right now, I'm just like, really? This guy was corrupt. This guy, you know, stole from people. This guy had all sorts of bad dealings in our state. And you see him as a hero. I mean, what does that say for uh, aspiring children growing up and going into the political realm when they, you know, take, you know, Louisiana history? Or like you mentioned, there's there's people like that from every state and every town, especially in Chicagoland. I mean, what kind of impression are we leaving on future generations? You know, that's simple. Crime pays. Yeah, I mean, it's just That's what the mindset. Teaching. Crime pays. If you want to get ahead in life and uh, accumulate a lot of money, you're, you become a political crook. Or work for a bank or on Wall Street or a transnational corporation. They're all crooks. Yeah, I mean, it's just sad. I mean, you see that happening on, on such a regular basis that you have – criminals just coming out of the woodwork like cockroaches they're all over the place they're in the governments all over the world they're in uh, the banks like you mentioned they're in all these big giant corporations and most of them they get away with it a few of them get stomped but i mean you know what one or two get stomped while you know thousands of them escape into the darkness in order to loot and pillage again i mean it's just it's just another prime example bob of the direction we're heading it sure is. It's indicative of what can be expected in the future. And there's no movement whatsoever to ever to stop this. I mean, it's uh, politically and socially acceptable to lie and be a crook. And it goes all the way to the top of the pyramid, all the way up to the elite. They're the ultimate criminals. And, you know, their ultimate plan, of course, is to you know bring forth this one world government through any which way possible. And one of their angles is obviously uh, the you know global warming, climate tra- change, fraud, and uh, this one coming out of the uh, Scientific American, Bob. Uh, they're talking about how effective world government will be needed to stave off climate catastrophe. And I'll read you a quick little quote from this uh, article. Uh, this is su- basically what they said about it: To be effective, a new set of institutions would have to be imbued with heavy-handed transnational enforcement powers. Now, uh, Bob. We all know that basically the uh, <laughs> the uh, Al Gore movement, you know, known as global warming, climate change, whatever you want to call it, is nothing more than a fraud and a farce. But and even though it's it's being exposed through ClimateGate and so many others, you know, out there on the front lines attacking it, you know, shooting holes through uh, their uh, <laughs> their, their um, fraud. Bob, why do they continue to push forward with this this? farce even though it's sinking like the titanic because they don't have any other choice and they already crossed the point of no return and they got to tough it out till the end and they're hoping that they've covered all the bases and um i don't think they have and you know what's really sad about this the person that wrote this article is probably a well-intentioned moron and my, my question for them would be like uh, an effective world government. Okay, well, name me one effective government that we've had. Obviously, we don't have a very effective government here in the United States. You take it to the next level in a super state level like the uh, European Union, uh, their government hasn't been very effective. It's falling apart. So how can we possibly have uh, an effective world government when it just seems like it's the definition of rep- you know, insanity when we repeat the mistakes over and over again of relying too heavily on people and government. You have to remember in their arrogance, they uh, believe that they are the masters of the universe and they know better what is good for us than we do. And uh, I think that's a strong underlying factor. You're right about that, Bob. They definitely do think very, very highly of themselves, unfortunately. And it's just what they've, you know, they've, they've been raised to believe this generation after generation. They believe they're little demigods, that they're better than us, that we're bugs to be squashed and stepped on. And basically, I mean, what they're doing, their, their plans, if, if they're allowed to, you know, be carried out, are ultimately going to lead towards their destruction as well. That's right. They don't see it that way. 
Yeah, it's just sad. I mean, I I just I, I look at it from so many angles. About you know, some of these people are are pretty smart individuals. These you know, elitist, and yet they they don't have the common sense to realize that if they attempted some sort of third world war that went nuclear, that how how can they even fathom the idea that it will be okay for them to come out of their bunkers a couple years later? I mean, the the fallout from a worldwide nuclear war with you know hundreds of nukes going off across the globe, that's going to be you know something that the planet is going to take probably several thousand years to recover from. But, you know, people want power. They want control over other people, and that's why you're seeing what you're seeing. Yeah, it's just it's sad because, you know, not only do they put our lives in jeopardy, but they, they put their lives up in the balance and, you know, their future generations. So it's it just makes me wonder, like, if, if there's ever a chance, maybe, just maybe, some of them will finally wake up one day and say, hey, wait a minute, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? And I don't think that's going to happen, unfortunately, but... My hope is that we, we're able to, Bob, wake up enough people and get enough people in governments to you know, stop them before it's too late. Well, all we can do is what we can do and keep on you know, doing what we're doing. And uh, maybe we'll be fortunate enough to stop them. Now, they can make a lot of mistakes, too, you know, and so that's to be considered. Definitely. And most of them really, you know, without their lieutenants, without all their pawns, they really have no legs to stand on. And sooner or later, it wouldn't surprise me if we start seeing some of those individuals, you know, start getting wise to which way the wind is starting to blow. And if that happens, then they're going to have the rug pulled out from under them. And I agree with that. Yeah, let's talk about Syria for a moment, because you brought that up a few moments ago, that report that Russia sent troops in. And I found that a little too difficult to swallow. I mean, I just think that Russia would probably uh, stay out of that because it's obviously an internal issue, this civil war going on. I mean, it, it does seem like that they're they're focusing a lot more on Syria now, similar to what they did to Libya a year ago. But at the same time, it's going to be a lot more difficult because of the fact you have now Russia and China saying, um, nope, don't do it, don't do it. We're not going to let you do it this time. And then you also have what's happening with the buildup of Iran. They've sent bunker busters to Israel. Bob, do you think that this year we're getting closer and closer to seeing some sort of conflict happen between, say, Israel and Iran or, you know, involving Syria as well? Or do you think that it'll probably be held off for another year or so? A year or so. But there'll be a lot of rhetoric and uh, there's no question that allied troops are inside Syria. And I think Russia has told uh, NATO to pull them out. And if they don't do that, then there will be Russians there. Now, see, that's a scary scenario right there, Bob. The idea that, you know, since we already have, you know, our troops on the ground in Syria, and if Russia sends in troops and China sends in troops, I mean, I mean that could escalate and spiral out of control, you know, in a blink of an eye. That's right. And, and, and that, that's concerning. I mean, that, that's, mm-hmm. It's it's very concerning. It, I mean, just just like the uh, situation in Iran. I mean, what they just uh, came out with some scenarios of a of a possible uh, attack and war with Iran, and they talked about how we would at least u- lose one warship, how we would uh, have casualties on our side. I mean, if, if they are crazy enough to pull this off, it's it's going to get very very nasty. And they are crazy enough to pull it off. Well, did you notice that? Um Charles uh, Rangel uh, resubmitted his uh, legislation into the House for a uh, selective service draft. Yeah, I mean, he keeps doing that every year, it seems like. He's really obsessed with with a, a draft system being reintroduced. And, you know, if he likes it so much, you know, Bob, I think he needs to uh, sign up and, you know, head on over to the uh, Middle East. Good place for him. Yeah. It is funny, though, how all these people are, are very pro-war, a lot of the neocons, and you know, even, even a lot of people on the left as well now, unfortunately. They're really hardcore about you know, invading countries, attacking countries, yet you go and you look at their, uh, their children and their grandchildren, and it's very hard to find any of them that are serving in military right now. 
No, I don't think you find any. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that honestly, I mean, if they want to go, us to go to war, then they need to sign up their kids or, you know, sign themselves up first. And, you know, imagine how quickly they would stop, you know, you know, slamming their fists on the pulpit calling for war if they knew that, you know, the consequence of that would lead them, you know, getting a rifle and getting a uniform and, you know, being, you know, put on the first ship. They've always sent other people's children to die in war. Occasionally you find that, uh, uh, that there's an exception to that, but uh, World War II was one of those. And escaping war during the Civil War was not easy either. Uh, but otherwise, um, that's the way it is. Exactly. And it's funny, you know, it's, it's the same thing you see from uh, Obama, you see from Romney, uh, Santorum and Gingrich, they're all a bunch of chicken hawks. I mean, back in what uh, Romney's college days. You know, he was uh, all in favor of the draft for Vietnam, but at the same time, because he happened to be a Mormon missionary, he didn't get to go to Vietnam. So, I mean, it was kind of a safe end for him to not have to uh, go to war while at the same time being pro-war. You're right, and there were many like that. Yeah, it's just a continuing endless cycle of uh, the chicken hawks in the Republican Party and also a growing number in the Democratic Party as well. Yet another example, Bob, how there's really no difference anymore. They're both bought and paid for and corrupt and have no real interest in the, you know, serving the people out of the Constitution. Bob, we got about a minute left. How can people get the International Forecaster? Uh, the Forecaster is uh, about business, finance, economic, social, and political issues all over the world, published on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Runs around 35, 40 pages each time. We have a hard copy that goes out twice a month for those who are not on the Internet. And everything you need to know each week is in there. Uh, if you'd like to get a copy of either, you can go to theinternationalforecaster.com. Theinternationalforecaster.com. If you'd like to uh, ask a question, and we answer everyone, or if you'd like to get a copy of the publication, or if you'd like to get a copy of our latest report in gold and silver shares, then email me, and that address is bob, B-O-V, at I-N-T-F-O-R-E-C-A-S-T-E-R dot com, bob at intforecaster.com. And for those of you who would like to call toll-free, that number is 877 479 8178. That's 877 479 8178. And you can get all the reports there. And if you'd like to become a subscriber, that's a good place to go to. And the reason for that is that they have a special offer there for a free one year subscription. And the offer that they're making, I think, is terrific, and you should take advantage of it if you want to be a subscriber. I definitely think it's a terrific deal as well, Bob. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, and I will talk to you next week, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>